So our third snippet is going to look at the, the race for the Republican nomination uh, in 1980 and then the, the run up to, uh, to Reagan's victory against, uh, against Carter. And although Reagan was the front runner uh, in, in 1980, largely based off his strong performance in the 1976 primaries, remember he almost defeated Ford in the primary. Um, there was also this impression that he was either too old or too conservative or a combination of, uh, of both uh, that made other Republicans jump into the race. Because again, remember Carter's approval ratings were going down. There was a sense he was, uh, he was vulnerable. The, the most prominent four were um, from the top, of, uh, top left of the screen were John Conley, who was a uh, uh, former Democrat. Remember, we heard a couple of his clips with LBJ. He was the governor of Texas conservative Democrat who defected to the Republican Party in 1973, uh, who was uh, very well connected, especially in the oil and gas industry, so raised lots of uh, money. Though his candidacy ultimately would fizzle, he would spend $12 million and get only one delegate in the election. The second was Howard Baker, um, the Republican leader of the, uh, the Senate, a uh, fairly moderate Republican from, uh, from Tennessee, um, well regarded by both parties, but he had a fatal problem. He had endorsed the Panama Canal uh, Treaty, which had become very unpopular with conservative activists, and so he was never able to quite get off the, uh, the ground. An interesting candidate was John Anderson, who we'll see a little bit more of in a second. Um, Anderson was a, um, a moderate Republican congressman from suburban uh, Chicago. Um, who ran as the, the, the sort of centrist voice in the uh, primaries very, very well in New England states. And then finally, George H.W. Uh, Bush, who had this intriguing background. He'd only served two uh, terms in Congress from, uh, from a, a district in Houston, but then had been uh, a, a CIA director, UN ambassador, the first de facto U.S. ambassador to, uh, to uh, the People's Republic of China, and the chairman of the Republican National Committee. And so he's, you know, this he lot brought a lot of executive uh, and appointive experience to, uh, to the position. Bush spent a lot of time in Iowa and in what was one of the biggest upsets in any presidential primary uh, race. Uh, in, in 1980, in the Iowa uh, caucuses, he defeats Ronald uh, Reagan. Um, and Afterwards, he, he claims in his acceptance speech that he now has Big Mo, which is supposed to stand for Big Momentum. One of the problems with Bush is you know, his, his father was a U.S. Senator from Connecticut. Um, Bush really was a resident of, of Kennebunkport, Maine, um, although he had, had moved to Texas and made a lot of money in the oil industry. And so he was always kind of trying too hard to come across as a common man, even though you know, he was from, uh, from old money and was, was very wealthy uh, himself. And so in the aftermath of, uh, of Iowa, he surged to the lead. It was expected that maybe he would beat Reagan in New Hampshire. And if he did that, he may be able to sweep to the nomination. And then a couple of things uh, uh, intervened. Um, the, the first was that uh, uh, Reagan sort of retooled his staff, um, you know, ran a much more aggressive campaign, focusing on Bush's perceived uh, uh, moderation. The second was that video clip that I've asked you to look at of, uh, of the run-up to, uh, to the candidates debate. Uh, Bush had agreed to a one-on-one -on -one debate between himself and Reagan. Um, Reagan had agreed to, uh, to rent the hall uh, to pay for the, uh, for the entire thing, um, largely because he was worried that he might lose to Bush. Um, but then in the, in the day before the debate, all of the other Republican candidates said they wanted to participate as well. Reagan eventually agreed to this. Bush, Bush refused. Um, and at the, the debate hall, the moderator attempted to enforce the rules. Reagan had this famous remark of, you know, I'm paying for this microphone. And it demonstrated this kind of leadership. Uh, Bush was kept on the defensive. Uh, Reagan wound up winning New Hampshire. And as you can see here, he basically swept the, uh, uh, the country. Um, Bush only carried the states that were in light blue. So Maine, which is sort of behind the screen here, he carried that, which is really his home state. Uh, Massachusetts, Connecticut, where his father had served as uh, senator. But apart from uh, outside of New England, only Iowa, Michigan, and, uh, and Pennsylvania, Reagan won every other state. None of the other Republicans did much of, uh, much of anything. Um, the Republican convention was held in Detroit. There was some talk that the ticket might be Reagan and Ford, because again, the perception was that Reagan was too, uh, too conservative.
Um, but Ford wanted too much power as vice president. In fact, Ford wanted to be co-president. Reagan rejected that. Um, and so ultimately the, the ticket wound up being Reagan and, uh, and Bush, although Bush had to change some of his uh, opinions to go onto the ticket. Um, Bush had attacked Reagan's economic policies, which were uh, lower taxes to, uh, on the grounds that cutting taxes would not increase the deficit. Bush had called that voodoo economics. He changes his mind on that. Um, and Bush had been a supporter of abortion rights. Reagan, by this point, was an opponent of, uh, of abortion rights. And Bush switches his position on that as, uh, as well. But they're, uh, they're nominated. Again, Carter is the nominee for, uh, for, the, for the Democrats, although you know, he's been weakened by the Kennedy, uh, the Kennedy challenge. There was one other interesting thing about the 1980 campaign that turned out to be fairly, uh, fairly important. John Anderson, remember, he was that moderate uh, congressman. He didn't win any uh, Republican primaries, although he did very well in Vermont, in Massachusetts, uh, in Maine, these sort of moderate northeastern uh, states. Um, and as uh, Kennedy lost to Carter, uh, Anderson repositioned himself as a, as a kind of uh, liberal, good government uh, uh, voice. He invited the man to his left here, Pat Lucy, who was a liberal uh, Democrat uh, from Wisconsin, the former uh, governor of Wisconsin, on this bipartisan independent uh, ticket. And Anderson had no chance of winning, although he was polling uh, nearly 20 percent um, at one point in the campaign. But he disproportionately drew from liberal voters, people who were happy with Kennedy, who didn't like Carter very much. Uh, and so Carter was sort of squeezed from both sides. On the one hand, he had this kind of good government challenge from, uh, from Anderson. And on the other hand, he had this challenge from, uh, uh, from, from Reagan. What really squeezed Carter though was the economy. Uh, the economy was in terrible uh, shape throughout the campaign. The prime rate was uh, at 20% in the spring of 1980. So anyone who wanted a mortgage would have to pay 25, 26%, a crippling blow basically the housing market came to a stop. Um, and unemployment started to trickle up and inflation was in double digits. So there really was no good signs economically throughout the, uh, throughout the campaign. And the hostage crisis continued throughout uh, the, uh, the summer into the fall with no apparent resolution in sight. Um, it's clear that the Ayatollah's regime had come to personalize, the, among other things, had come to personalize with this with, uh, with Carter. And so they made it apparent that they were not going to release the hostages before the election out of a sense that that might help uh, uh, Carter do so. And indeed, the hostages would not be released until just after Reagan had been nominated to make, uh, Reagan had been inaugurated to make sure that uh, e even in defeat, Carter would not have the honor of welcoming the hostages back, uh, back home. Nonetheless, um, the campaign remained relatively close uh, within the margin of error in polling until late October. There was only one presidential uh, debate uh, in 1980, in large part because of disputes between the Carter and Reagan teams. Carter said he would not appear at any debate where John Anderson also was invited because he sensed that Anderson was um, um, was was taking votes away from uh, from him on the left. So the debate occurred in Cleveland, um, and Reagan's strategy in this debate was to appear moderate reassuring, comforting, kind of distance himself from his previously very conservative uh, positions. Carter's was to attack him as too right wing. Uh, the problem was that Reagan, among other things, was a gifted communicator. And this line is the most famous line from the debate, which uh, Reagan sort of uses to effectively neutralize the, uh, the Carter attacks. Governor Reagan, as a matter of fact, began his political career campaigning around this nation against Medicare. Now we have an opportunity to move toward national health insurance with an emphasis on the prevention of disease, an emphasis on outpatient care, not inpatient care, this is a reminder. an emphasis on hospital uh, cost containment to hold down COVID? the cost of hospital care for those who are ill, an emphasis on catastrophic health insurance so that if a family is threatened with being wiped out economically because of, very, of a very high uh, medical bill, then the insurance would help pay for it. These are the kind of elements of a national health insurance important to the American people. Governor Reagan, again, typically is against such a proposal. Governor, <laughs> there you go again. The, the irony of this is that Carter's attack was actually basically true, uh, but Reagan's idea was to, to sort of portray uh, Carter as dismissive and to suggest that these attacks were made in bad faith. 
which wound up uh, being quite effective in, uh, uh, as, as an approach. And in the end, it's not just that Reagan wins, it's that there's a massive move towards uh, Reagan in the last week of the campaign, and Reagan sweeps uh, uh, to, uh, to victory, carrying 44 of 50 uh, uh, states. Um, and this is a, a much like the 76 Carter Ford map, this is a really interesting map. I think you know we can pretty much say an assurance that if at any time in the next 20 or 30 years, the Democrats only win six uh, states in the presidential election, West Virginia is not going to be one of those six. But at the time, West Virginia was a reliably Democratic Union state. Um, Carter also carried his home state of Georgia, his running mate's home state of Minnesota, uh, and then Rhode Island, uh, uh, Maryland, and, uh, and Hawaii. You'll notice in, in, Massachusetts, in uh, Massachusetts and New England, Carter uh, did very poorly in the region. But that was largely due uh, to the efforts of John Anderson. Anderson got between 12 and 16 percent of the vote in every New England state except for Maine, where he got 10 percent. Um, and Anderson also did well in, uh, upper, in the upper Midwest and in the Pacific Coast. And this is a map that's worth keeping way, way, way in the back of your minds, um, because the, the states that Anderson did well in were also states that in the 2008 Democratic primary between Obama and Clinton were, were states where Obama had lots of support in, in, in New England, uh, in the upper Midwest, uh, and in the Pacific West. And so Anderson activated this, this kind of core of liberals who would start swinging towards the Democratic Party into the 80s and, uh, and the 90s. One other critically important thing about the 1980 election, we've seen landslides, Republican landslides on this course before in 1956 with Dwight Eisenhower in 1972 with Ronald Reagan. But in both of those elections, there was not an accompanying, accompanying strong Democratic uh, 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 defeats in the Senate elections. That didn't happen in 1980. Uh, the Democrats uh, lose dozens of seats in the House and they lose 12 seats in the Senate, uh, their biggest uh, uh, setback in the Senate at any point in the uh, post-World War II era. And the senators who lose are important uh, uh, senators, major players in the body from the, from the upper uh, left. Uh, Warren Magnuson, who was the chairman of the, of the Appropriations Committee, that's the, the committee in the Senate that oversees spending programs. Frank Church from Idaho, Carter's one-time rival in 1976. He was the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, so the, the party's top spokesman on international affairs. Below him was Birch Bayh, um, Democratic senator from, uh, from Indiana and a key player on the Senate Judiciary uh, Committee, a liberal voice on civil liberties, on gender and race issues. Um, and then uh, on the bottom uh, left, George McGovern from South Dakota, the Democrats presidential nominee in 1972, who lost his seat in 1980 by almost 20 points, just a, a complete repudiation of his, uh, of his uh, approach. And you saw it really throughout the country. Uh, Democrats lost all of the uh, states that are in bright red on this map. So these are Democratic senators who lost their seats and the seats went Republican. So we saw it in the Pacific Northwest in Idaho, uh, Washington, and Alaska. We saw it in the upper Midwest with Wisconsin, Iowa, and, uh, and South Dakota, the industrial Midwest with Indiana, uh, the Northeast with New Hampshire, uh, and then the Southeast, uh, uh, Alabama, uh, Georgia, Florida, and North Carolina. So Reagan is going to be coming in with a much more conservative Congress and with Republicans in majority in the U.S. Senate for the first time since 1954. So there's a real sense that he has a chance to uh, accomplish a significant uh, policy shift. And that's what we'll be looking at in our next, uh, uh, next uh, snippet.